Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, governance in the Arctic, especially in the light of uh, the acceptance of new permanent observers uh, in, at the meeting in Higuruna in uh, 2013. Um, this, this is the uh, short outline of the presentations. I will start by mentioning the impact of climate change and then see how these is security issues as a consequence of the climate change will have an uh, impact on govern governance challenges. And then just uh, to review the structure of uh, the Arctic Council um, and about how it's going to adapt to the new situation with uh, more different permanent observers. And then raise the questions for a general discussion on the, the role of Asian countries in, in the Arctic Council. And if there will be time, I will also add there's other uh, issues uh, also among the member states. And here I take uh, Denmark Greenland as an example of that. So <clears throat> the climate change uh, impact in the Arctic is mainly two important things. <coughs> the perspective of an ice-free Arctic Ocean and uh, the possibilities of uh, an easier access to natural resources in the region. These are uh, the, the findings um, of the, uh, the National uh, Center for Ice and Snow Data in the US. It shows a steady decline, not steady, it shows a decline of the extent of the, the, the sea ice around the North Pole. So it has gone down from 1979 when the first data are available until uh, first uh, record in 2007 and then the second one in 2012. Uh, the map shows uh, the white spot is the ice in 2012 and the yellow line and the black line are earlier uh, uh, record low and the, the black line is the average extent uh, in the period from 1979 to 2000. So that's a drastical uh, decline in the extent of sea ice under the North Pole. Also, the ice sheet of Greenland, uh, is a, it's, uh, first it's important for Greenland, it covers 80% of, of the territory. Um, and there's also been a decline uh, 30 percent uh, uh, increase in the decline of of the ice sheet, also with a, a record of, <clears throat> of the melt uh, in 2007. If all the ice sheet of Greenland was going to melt, which is not the case, it would mean that the sea level would rise seven meters. The prognosis is very difficult to to have any certainties, but it has an impact on the sea level around the globe. These are pictures taken uh, by NASA, and uh, they went around the world and caused uh, some alarm. Uh, the red color just shows that the surface of the, of the ice sheet of Greenland is above uh, zero degree, and the white is when it's below. So this is just the, 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 the left picture is from the 8th of July, 2012, the other one is four days later, but next day it was again below zero. So that's not a, a reason for uh, any kind of alarm, uh, but uh, it's just natural, or I mean, the, the, the temperature changes. But it reminds us about uh, what are the perspective is actually the, the ice melts or, and there's an increase in the, in the, in the melt. So the impact of uh, these changes of the climate is, of course, as we also have discussed earlier at the conference, um, the possibility of new shipping routes and uh, more accessibility to, uh, to natural resources. Uh, the right-hand picture is the so-called ISUA project uh, in the near, in the, near to, the, to Nuuk, the capital of Greenland where the London Mining Project was planning 
and are planning is planning sorry uh, to to um, to make a, an iron mine uh, the reason I put this picture is that it's shown as if the the melting of the ice sheet has any has an impact on the possibility of, of making an, a, a mine site on that place and this is why I want also to mention that uh, there is a specific rhetoric about climate change. I take one example here from the opening speech of the Greenlandic Premier, Alexa Hammond. She said uh, in 2013 at the opening of the, the Greenlandic Parliament, climate change and the receding ice means that new business opportunities become available. Cruise ships can now sail further north mining industry can expand their exploration of raw materials and the more ice-free northwest passage, maybe also a northeast passage or the northern sea route, may in the future play a role as an alternative route to, for container traffic to and from Asia. So this is the, the picture, the narrative about climate change that tries or have the, the purpose of uh, uh, pointing to, to opportunities that is a consequence of climate change. Uh, and there's a whole uh, row of items in these kind of narratives that are, seems to be causal, as causal relation between the, the item, which may be not the case. Uh, in the case of the Isua mining, the site has the place of the, the, the resource has been known for 40 years. So it's not uh, that the, the receding of the ice is not the, the reason. Maybe it's an impulse for companies actually to explore and also to extract the, the minerals. As, but there's not this kind of causal relationship that's put uh, in this kind of narrative. But when you repeat a narrative often enough, people not only maybe believe it, but they act as if it is the real truth. One of these last uh, uh, sequence in, in this narrative uh, is the, the idea that this is what also generates the Asian interests in the Arctic. And a second one that I want to point uh, on, on the line is that it also generates issues of security and therefore also challenges of governance in the Arctic. So, uh, the, the security issues uh, means that you uh, are reminded that the Arctic is a vulnerable region and that you need to meet these uh, challenges in, in, in uh, terms of human securities. So the question is, uh, what kind of organization or structure do we have? And we, of course, already have the Arctic Council at hand. And therefore, the debate has, has, uh, has, has been coming up. Is it, can it transform itself from a so-called debate forum to a decision-making body making legally uh, binding decisions? Um, in the rhetoric of uh, NGOs like WWF, uh, they point out that a new warmer Arctic cannot continue to operate on the rules that assume it is ice covered and essentially closed to fishing, to resource exploration and extraction, and to shipping. So therefore they ask for this decision-making body. And I think it's fair to say that according to the Arctic Council's own record, they point to the decision at the meeting in 2013 on oil spill, and also at the decision in 2011 on the search and rescue, as examples that they actually are capable of, of making uh, binding decisions for the member states. I also think it's fair to say that uh, these decisions are only a little more than a compilation of already existing national duties. But of course, it's the Arctic is better off now than it was before these uh, endeavors to, to uh, cooperate also in certain rescue terms. We have to look uh, at the structure of the Arctic Council. Now there are, there are eight member states, and we have also mentioned earlier that that's the, the, the core five Arctic states with 
the coastal states and three others without uh, coast, coast to the Arctic Ocean. There are six permanent participants, which are indigenous peoples, and then there are 32 permanent observers. Among them, 11 non-governmental organizations, nine intergovernmental or interparliamentary organizations, seven non-Arctic, which is a European state, and then five new non-Arctic Asian states. Uh, so it is a very diversified uh, organization. Uh, it has rules or procedures that, that is, uh, determine that decisions are made by member states um, after involving of the permanent participants. Observers can, should of course observe, but they can also have the possibility of contributing to the discussion by making statements, etc. So, the question I think is, what are the consequences to be expected from the participation of Asian permanent observers in the work of the Arctic Council? Both this idea of strengthening the Council as a decision-making body, or maybe contributing to preserving the nature uh, of the Arctic Council as a debate forum, which is maybe exactly what makes it uh, an open and inclusive uh, organization. I think is we also should be uh, open uh, to this is not, there's also a, an amount of self-interest in the in inclusiveness of, of the Arctic Council. Uh, for instance, uh, the Danish Prime Minister here welcoming Yang Yiji uh, from the Foreign Minister of China. Uh, the, the, the rationale uh, uh, of uh, Denmark as a small state, in the words of Willy Sjöndal, the Foreign Minister, is that if we do not include them in the Arctic Council, they may make their own organization and then that would be a much worse situation for the Arctic Council. So we want them to sit at the table, as it is put, in order to that we can have a dialogue, which is much better than bigger states, as China will overrule the decision of the Arctic Council. If I can take the last minutes, I would point to that there's also other uh, problem makers in the Arctic Council. Um, and this is, uh, again, the Danish foreign minister talking to the premier of Greenland, Alekha Hammond. And um, there is also, and there was a kind of boycott action from the side of Greenland to the meeting in, in Sweden in 2013. And the Danish foreign minister wanted Greenland to come back to participate in the Arctic Council. <coughs> Um, and this may be a little bit confusing for people not really knowing the, the uh, relations between the different parts of the Danish state. So I'll just give a very quick overview over this. Uh, Greenland is a self-governing territory within the Kingdom of Denmark. Uh, it ha it's a non-sovereign country, especially in foreign policy issues. Denmark is the sovereign state, but it's also a union of different parts of the Kingdom of Denmark, which is then a community of states consisting of Denmark proper and Greenland and the Faroe Islands. Normally we'll see a map, Greenland mentioning Denmark also, and one could wonder why. If you see the full kingdom uh, as such, Denmark is a peculiar state in Europe with a big uh, part of it uh, in America and in the Arctic. This is what makes Denmark an Arctic state actually. Um, the history of, of Greenland is in newer times. It was a colony until 1953. Then it was integrated into Denmark. And then it, it was granted home rule in, in 1979. And new uh, self-government act was, was adopted in 2009. This is the Danish Green giving the act to the Greenlandic people, represented by the chair of the Greenlandic parliament. This uh, act determines that uh, Greenlanders are a people according to international law and therefore also have the right to self-determination and independence and there's also like a roadmap for independence mentioned in the self-government act 
uh, how it should be decided. So it's a possibility mentioned in the law, so it wouldn't be a kind of surprising break. It's just in, as I said, in the roadmap. Uh, Greenland has not uh, sovereignty within certain policy areas, and most importantly, maybe in this connection, foreign policy. Uh, they need a uh, uh, Greenland is not economically sustainable, so they actually need the yearly grant from Denmark to, to continue as it is. And uh, this is maybe the, uh, the reason why there's so much important put on extractive resources. In the words of Aleke Hammond uh, at the meeting in Tromsø, the, the Arctic frontiers, she said, I want Greenland to have a self-sustaining economy based on our own resources. Greenland's long-term political goal is independence. And this is what creates tension between these two ladies, the Prime Minister of Greenland and the Prime Minister of uh, Denmark. And I think this is going also to make an impact on the Arctic Council in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Uffe, for the presentation and for keeping the time. Njord Wege from Fridtjof Nansen Institute will talk about China's Arctic diplomacy. Let me see. There. So uh, my name is uh, Njord Wege. Uh, I'm writing this uh, article together with uh, Ying Xiaopeng, uh, Chinese, native Chinese. Uh, I'll first say something about the background for the project, and uh, then I'll talk a little bit about China's uh, diplomacy, history, and background before uh, having a brief review on the bilateral diplomacy of the five Arctic Ocean coastal states plus Iceland, and uh, some preliminary findings in them. So at, uh, at the CNARC symposium last year, uh, Ying Xiaopeng and I also had a presentation that I held there. Uh, that was on China's... Um yeah. That was on uh, China's uh, China and the Law of the Sea implication for Arctic governance. Uh, that will be published in uh, the Polar Journal this fall. So uh, based on that success, we, we thought we should uh, start up on a new project. So therefore, we selected China's Arctic diplomacy, because this is not so much studied in itself. And it also fits well into the Ar Asiatic program at the Fritjo Nansen Institute. Is it oh, I don't know. Do we have technical support here? Yeah, it's OK. So. Um, so our uh, sort of guiding research questions are, what are the most important differences between the A5 plus Iceland? Um, to what degree has it been a success or not, the bilateral diplomacy? Uh, what's the weaknesses and strength of China's uh, uh, way of pursuing, when it's trying to pursue its interest in, in the Arctic? And uh, how does China change if they change their preferences? Why and when does that happen? So. With respect to diplomacy, obviously it's an important part of the state system itself, and it's closely linked to the power of the states, but not necessarily power capabilities. So I think this um, citation of Hedley Bull is good. Uh, the diplomat seeks to always reason or persuade rather than bully or threaten. He tries to show that the objective for which he is seeking is consistent with the other party's interest as well as his own kind of like the core um, or the essence of diplomacy. So uh, since China is emerging as a great power, this is an interesting case in, by any means in IR studies. And I think uh, China's Arctic diplomacy is a, is a pretty novel um, object in itself. And uh, we could select and uh, we're thinking about several different approaches to this. So one, one focus could be to to investigate it from a more like realist point of view, like power shifts, etc., or or the more liberal approach, typically focusing on economic growth, interdependence, you know, facilitating for for cooperation, etc. 
while constructivist approaches typically would focus more on uh, sorry, uh, identities, values, norms, etc. And two topics that already has been mentioned a few times is China's resource diplomacy and, and also science diplomacy. So all of these angles are relevant, I would say, and, and we don't necessarily select one approach. We try to have a more a holistic uh, approach to it. So yesterday we saw a picture of the science diplomacy. I think this is a good illustration of the resource diplomacy that we typically associate when, when we hear about China investing in, in uh, for example, the, thir the third world. Uh, when we deal with the China's diplomacy, I think to establish sort of like the historical background is very important. Uh, obviously, the, the millenn millennium-long history as a middle kingdom um, is a very important part of, of Chinese uh, self-image, but also the center of national humiliation is much closer in time uh, between uh, the Opium War and, and the end of the Second World War. Where, Japan, uh, where China was uh, dominated by foreign powers, basically. And then you have uh, the, the more recent history where uh, Mao actually had gotten the power and defeated uh, Chiang Kai-shek, but still was not recognized by, by the Western powers and was not accepted as rep legitimate representative in the UN. Uh, so this kind of like led to a, 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 a distrust to the, the diplomatic system for a very long time. Uh, and especially with uh, Deng Xiaoping that we see this new uh, reform and opening process where also the diplomacy are getting normalized. And, and obviously the WTO membership in 2001 is a, it's a very important milestone for China being integrated in the diplomatic system. Uh, another f factor that's uh, relevant is the, the strong focus on econ economic growth. Obviously, um, uh, there's more uh, softer issues, uh, sustainability, etc., uh, very high on the agenda today, but the heritage with a strong focus on economic growth are also reflected in the, in the diplomacy. So the economic incentives uh, could certainly be a, a driver also within the diplomacy itself when you see how it's sort of operating. And obviously uh, the Chinese diplomacy also have a role in supporting the, the, the Communist Party, ensuring that it stays in power. So uh, with this background, uh, we definitely see that the bilateral diplomacy is much more developed uh, in China uh, compared to its multilateral uh, missions around the world. And uh, compared to its size, China certainly is uh, very passive and, and, and usually reactive and multilateral for us if you compare to its size, for example, in the UN Security Council. Uh, and um, there's also a tendency to being oriented towards focusing on protecting economic interests rather than, as I see right here, bring together other states, developing new ideas, mm -hmm. taking new initiatives. And uh, David Schaumburg from Georgetown typically called China a partial diplomatic power because of this. Uh, just a brief review of the decision-making system. It's, it's kind of hard to really understand it. It's sometimes talk about the black box, you know, the, the sort of the elite level in China. However, there's no doubt that there's a senior leader level that makes the key decisions. But also the ministries and governmental agencies make decisions in foreign policy while intelligence origins, research institutes, think tanks, universities that some of you represent here probably have more an advisor role, uh, as well as uh, corporations, state-owned enterprises, and, and in the end also uh, media, individual blogging activities, etc., trying to influence decision-making. So I think the general tendency also is that from being very centralized, uh, elitistic, uh, diplomatic decision-making are getting broader and they are getting inputs from, from a broader, um, so ever-growing broader circles, to, 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 to put it that way. <clears throat> so if we look at Canada, obviously the Northwest Passage is very um, important when uh, China deals with uh, Canada in, a, in an Arctic context. Um, also the trading partner aspect, it's, uh, 
It's, a ver it's the second largest trading partner for Canada, and energy and minerals are very important, and, and especially investments are also a key issue for Canada. There's uh, talks about the free trade agreement. But I think we, c we could uh, observe that in spite of the Chinese uh, investment, uh, Canada has not been very actively supporting the involvement of non-Arctic states. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's an interesting observer, uh, observation in that respect. Again, Russia, biggest Arctic state, key partner for China and the Arctic. Uh, again, the energy sector is a, is a core issue here, as well as the shipping. And as we heard yesterday, there's recently signed a deal on, on gas, and also uh, it's, it's connected to uh, ship, shipping and logistics support in the Northern Sea Route. But this is a very complex relationship. And as we also barely touched on yesterday, uh, issues like the Ukraine and, you know, like the big sort of uh, global geopolitical outlooks for China and Russia are, are sort of connected to also the, the, the Arctic engagement probably. For example, when Europe wants to uh, be less dependent on Russian gas, it's obviously likely for, for Russia to look to China. <clears throat> and again, uh, kind of like uh, parallel to, Ch to Canada, we see that in spite of Russia and, and uh, China often uniting sometimes in an opposition to the West, for example, in, in the UN Security Council. There's a there has been a skepticism uh, to involve non-Arctic states and China in Arctic governments, also on behalf of Russia. <coughs> so for you, the US, I think it's fair to say that the, the Arctic, uh, the Arctic uh, debate or, or, or issue areas are of less relevance because it's so many key global issues that are very important for, for China and, uh, and the US. And, um, um, uh, yeah, but, um, but, but that's also is right here on the third point. I think in many ways, China find the US as being in sort of promoting many of the Chinese interests. For example, when it comes to freedom of navigation, and to a certain expect, expect also the, the issue about global commons. While, for example, Russia and Canada might have a little bit more, let's call it nationalist approach. Not, not, let's not take it too far, but I think at least there's a tendency where the US might have a little bit more um, uh, common viewpoints with, um, with China. <clears throat> but obviously there's always pressing uh, other topics that are, might overshadow the, the Arctic uh, issue areas. And as we just have heard, uh, Denmark and Greenland has a strong relationship to, to China, and it has been uh, mutually uh, visits of head of states. And there's a potential for Greenland being a sort of like the showcase of uh, long-term Chinese investment in, in natural resources. But as we, as we know, I mean, because of uh, media exposure and problems when the public sort of starting debating it, it's, it's, it's in stalemate now, and, and it's, uh, it's really hard to see exactly how it will develop. And there's also uncertainties on the, on the long-term uh, employment, pol employment situation and, and environmental policy in Greenland, as well as the issue of independence, obviously. So here we see a couple of pictures. The, the Danish queen uh, taking uh, or being the host for the, for the Chinese president. And, I think it's fair to say that the, of all the Arctic states, Iceland is probably the, the most enthusiastic country when it comes to really uh, inviting uh, China to several aspects of uh, their Arctic uh, engagement, especially after the financial crisis. It was obvious that China was willing to invest and, 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 uh, and uh, engage with uh, Iceland. Uh, there has been a lot of bilateral agreements um, and uh, we also know that uh, Iceland was a strong supporter for China in the, in the Arctic Council as an observer. Um, I also think, uh, as, as I write in the end here, um, the proximity to Greenland might matter. So in case of uh, resource development in Greenland, uh, the infrastructure is very limited. So actually, the, the fact that Iceland is quite close geographically might 
but also play a role in the long term for why China is so interested in uh, developing uh, infrastructure on Iceland. <clears throat> And obviously, uh, Norway is a spe strange uh, or special example. Uh, it's an example of uh, China playing hardball in uh, its diplomacy. And uh, just before the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010, it was almost a deal on free trade, or, or like the first free trade ag agreement was almost signed. And through the Liu Xiaobo Peace Prize uh, incident, we see a glimpse of, of like the really core problems when chi for China when the foreign states intervene in their domestic affairs, as they view it, and how sensitive this is. And it's a really uh, powerful case of how the leadership respond force forceful forcefully. Uh, and uh, in October 2010, the Minister of Fisheries and Coastal Affairs went to China, was supposed to have a meeting, everything was cancelled, and since then, there has been no contact on political level between Norway and China. Um, and I just picked out a few few issues here. I mean, there's so there's so much that could be said, but in general, uh, there's the impression that uh, China uh, wants an excuse from Norway um, after the peace prize, uh, and uh, there's a tendency that the new ambassador spend most of his time outside Oslo, for example visiting Trump's, uh, I think, almost 10 times now. And for example, I was a PhD student in, in Tromsø. There were reports of people from Northern Norway got visas to a conference in China, but no one from Oslo, being exactly the same kind of persons from universities. Um, but I think the general picture is that the, most of the bilateral uh, relationship have continued as before, and also including trade, but there are key areas so like fish or I talk, talked about this academic uh, visa situation. But in general, it's the, it's the polit uh, political top level that are affected. That, that's where the, the change is. And also, um, I would just want to say that um, there is probably a, a... Also, on the Norwegian side, it's kind of secretive, a little bit of where, where do we go, what do we do. But from uh, Jonas Garstøre to Espen Bart Eide, to labor uh, foreign ministers, it was, probably was a shift towards being a little bit more open towards trying to find a solution. And this has just continued with Berge Brande, our current foreign minister. And uh, he's uh, really uh, trapped in a, in a difficult situation. Uh, last week, um, Dalai Lama visited Norway, and it was a lot of talk about that in the Norwegian media. And as you see up to the right here, here's the foreign minister in 2010. Then he was the leader of the Tibet committee in the parliament, pretty much very concerned for the t Tibetan communities. And today, he did not want to meet Dalai Lama as a political gesture to, to China. It was a big concession. And uh, the, uh, the president in the parliament did not allow um, uh, Dalai Lama to use the sort of like the, the regular hall so they had to go to the movie theater in the parliament. Uh, so the parliamentarians up to the left that wanted to meet him. And again, it was just a symbolic act to try to, to, imp yeah, to improve the relationship to China. And uh, yeah, it was a big, uh, <laughs> big event. Also, uh, with lots of people in Norway wanted to see Dalai Lama. And there was anti-Dalai -Dala Lama protests, you see. And so, so this is a very hot uh, topic. Just concluding very fast here. So, I think we could see uh, the bilateral diplomacy being the key in Arctic uh, diplomacy. The Nordic sta states, particularly Iceland, is, uh, is, a, is a core state for, Is uh, for China. And uh, the bilateral relationship to Norway is very uh, sensitive and unsettled. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And we have heard about the problems with uh, Chinese investment generating lots of local opposition. And I think this is a key thing for the Chinese government also. They, they are sensitive to this and knows it. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> Next presenter is uh, Deng Beiji from Polar Research Institute of China.
Uh, okay, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm going to talk about the reconstruction of Arctic identity from the perspective of critical geopolitics. And I chosen uh, critical geopolitics as a theoretical angle to my presentation. And I will begin with a theoretical comparison between uh, mm -hmm. critical, critical geopolitics and traditional geopolitics. While traditional geopolitics deals with practice of power, it self-defines as an objective science and treats geography as a pre-existing uh, fact and a stable given in fear of simplistic uh, territorial dichotomy. Such dichotomy also exists in the Arctic context. As we know, the Arctic Council has made distinctions between Arctic states and non-Arctic states. And even within the Arctic Council, uh, uh, as stated in the Ilulisa Declaration, the five Arctic coastal states and the other users of the ocean bear differentiated rights and duties. Well, to the contrary, uh, critical geopolitics question the objectivity and the factual nature of geography and seek to break such dichotomies. It approached geography as an essential part of power of discourse and emphasized the influence of subjective factors such as culture and political entity, identity in framing geopolitical thoughts and practices. Uh, for example, uh, in the Arctic, with the trend of globalization, the Arctic in the geopolitical sense has enlarged the scope of the Arctic in the geographical sense. On one hand, the interaction between the Arctic and the world politics have intensified. For example, the impact of climate change in the Arctic uh, and the strategic importance of the Arctic sea route has global, con uh, global consequences. And on the other hand, uh, the fact that uh, the geopolitical boundary of the Arctic has been constantly expanding involve a broader participation of actual regional actors in the Arctic issues, and also the creation of new concepts related to the Arctic. To name a few of that, uh, for example, <coughs> near Arctic states, uh, the Arctic stakeholders, and the global Arctic. The, such proposition re uh, reveals the interests and identities of a particular uh, state in the Arctic and also the reconstruction of the state's interest, uh, state interest and identities are among the main theme of critical mm -hmm. geopolitics. <coughs> Another very important and feature that differentiates uh, critical geopolitics from traditional geopolitics is the different perspective on discourse. Well, traditional geopolitics deals more on power practice than discourse, mm -hmm. while critical geopolitics investigate how ge uh, geographical claim and assumptions function in political debate and what role the discourse can play in the construction of national sphere of influence and uh, in the formation of uh, geopolitical culture and identities of particular states. And for example, we have past, uh, past practices, uh, of, uh, especially the, pro uh, the proposition of, uh, of, for example, High North by Norway and the Northern Dimension by Finland in attempt to incorporate the European Union into the participation of Arctic issue has demonstrated how this course can be employed as a tool to define a geopolitical area in a political way. And, well, as being said, the economies exist in the Arctic context. The states marginalized from participants of Arctic issues, uh, namely the non-Arctic states and non-Arctic non coastal states, have attempted to redefine and reconstruct their Arctic identity by means of establishing uh, either geographical, environmental, ecologic, economic, or legal connection to the Arctic 
in order to justify their proper presence and involvement in the active tissue. <clears throat> and uh, we have example today, the ge geographical claim of Iceland as an active coastal state and also China as a near active state will well illustrate the relationship between geographical re-identification and the practices of foreign policy of a state. So we'll, I, I will first uh, look at the example of Iceland. Uh, in the face of the exclusiveness and the hegemony of the Arctic Five in the Arctic Ocean Management and their practices of territorialization of the Arctic Ocean in name of stewardship of collective security as reflected in the Ar Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement and also uh, in name of prevention of environmental degradation that could be triggered by navigation hazard as reflected in the agreement on cooperation on marine oil mm -hmm. pollution preparedness and the response in the Arctic. Iceland being a land surrounded by, uh, adjacent, by seas adjacent to the Arctic Ocean, holds the belief that the Arctic Ocean is not a narrowly defined geopolitical space with little connection to its adjacent waters. And also the Icelandic government has taken various measures to justify and further solidify state, the status of Iceland as a coastal state, uh, which the first, of course, enactment of national policies. There is a parliamentary resolution of 12 principles on Icelandic Arctic policy. As you can see here, it states promoting understanding of the fact that Arctic region extends both to the North Pole and uh, area proper and to the parts of North Atlantic Ocean which is closely connected to it. Such policy enactment reminds its counterpart in the Arctic Council and also its domestic uh, audience of the geopolitical and the legal connection of the Iceland to the Arctic Ocean. For example, the, Ar the Arctic region extends to the northern hemisphere of the Atlantic Ocean and Icelandic economic zone extends to the Greenland Sea, which is also an, uh, an marginal sea to the Arctic Ocean. And uh, as the uh, signatory party to the Swarbot uh, Treaty, Iceland also enjoys equal rights to be engaged in commercial activities and resources exploration in Swarbot and its surrounding waters. Uh, the second is the development of economy and industry related to, to the Arctic Ocean. Uh, especially in the as aftermath of the financial crisis and taking into consideration the geographically strategic location of Iceland in the convergence of the North Atlantic Ocean and the, the Arctic Ocean, Iceland shifts its focus back to the export-oriented service and rural economies connected to the exploration of the resources in the Arctic and in the Arctic Ocean. For example, uh, the global warming brings the fish stock migrating to northward, which will have impact on the fishery the industry of subsistence to Iceland economy. And also with opening of the sea route, Iceland has the pot potential to develop, to develop its hub ports for, trans uh, uh, for transatlantic and transarctic shipping uh, between Asia and Euro-America, which is also an opportunity for Iceland to invest in infrastructure. A uh, license has uh, also been granted to competent international companies for prospection of oil and gases in the Icelandic exclusive zone, uh, for example, the Jamayan region. The third is sub-regionalization. Uh, Iceland advocates sub-regionalization with its neighboring Arctic stakeholder and promote uh, uh, the intergovernmental cooperation with Greenland, notably, and the Faroe Island in the northwest uh, region, uh, in, the, uh, in the western Arctic region. Iceland shares a lot of similarity with the two independent Arctic actors, not only similar economic structure and the geopolitical location, but also a desire for 
uh, a consolidated voice and a greater power of distance and recognition in the active fears. Such correlation reminds, uh, reminds us of the alliance of small Iceland states in the climate change negotiation, uh, which means more, the combination of small uh, player will sometimes generate more power. And the fourth, uh, Iceland actively initiate Arctic-related scientific, academic, and economic platform and dialogue. For example, Iceland held the chairmanship of the Arctic Council Working Group, uh, PAMA, Protection of Arctic Marine Environment, and also initiate Arctic Circle Conferences. In doing so, Iceland attempt to shape its reputation as the uh, center of uh, Arctic knowledge, especially in the domain of uh, Arctic marine environment, biology, and Arctic shipping. So from the example of Iceland, we see state identity is, is, is forged through foreign practices by establishing geographical, environmental, economic, and legal connection to the Arctic Ocean the status of being a coastal state gradually become part of Icelandic na national identity, which, however, needs to be pushed for broadly recognized and acknowledged. In third part, I will uh, switch to China. Okay, given the fact that uh, the short distance of China uh, from the China's northernmost border to the Arctic uh, Circle reach almost uh, 1,500 kilometers. The China's involvement in the Arctic affairs has been challenged and uh, questioned. However, uh, uh, Arctic for China is primarily a destination for scientific research expeditions. However, with the melting of sea ice, the geopolitical space of the Arctic has been expanding and uh, at the same time, China's geopolitical and geoeconomic interests voluntarily converge with the geophysical changes in the Arctic. Under such circumstances, the very notion of near Arctic states is proposed first by the academia, then reiterated by Chinese officials in various occasions. So how we perceive near Arctic states so I think this should uh, embody three criteria. First, geographically located in the, in the Northern Hemisphere and geopolit geopolitically related to Arctic affairs and geoeconomically interested in the Arctic passage and uh, uh, Arctic business opportunities. So as a state, okay. Okay, uh, as a state located in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, any subsoil environmental changes in the Arctic may generate substantial consequences to, to China. And we know the environmental system in the Northeast Asia is amplifier of that of the Arctic. And scientific evidence has shown that extreme weather conditions in China that China has suffered has connection to the climate change in the Arctic. And what's more, the rising of sea ice is also very preoccupying. Such consequences justify the need of China for more scientific input and a very active participation in the Arctic Council's working group in order to have more knowledge on the pattern of the Arctic, uh, have more knowledge on the pattern of the climate change in the Arctic in order to prevent and predict the, the potential environment disaster that uh, could uh, happen in China. And also, has, for most Arctic stakeholder, the changes in the Arctic can be regarded as a double-edged sword. Resilience and better adaptation to such changes could bring about positive consequences. For example, the new navigable Arctic Sea Route to shorten the distance from any northern Chinese port to Europe and the east coast of America, creating direct and substantial economic returns. And furthermore, if the, re if the opening of the Arctic Sea Route as an alternative and uh, complementary passage to the current sea line is linked to the safeguard of navigation safety, to the diversification of maritime transportation of commodity, and to the energy supply, 
and together with the huge uh, energy reserve in the Arctic, the geopolitical significance and strategic value of the Arctic to China will be further enhanced. So, okay, I will then just uh, make a uh, conclusion. <laughs> the notice of the Arctic, uh, uh, the notion of near Arctic states illustrates the uh, geographical and environmental ties between China and the Arctic. The proposition of near Arctic states is followed by the admission of China into the observer, uh, 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 to the observer status in the Arctic Council and intensified Arctic cooperation of China with Nordic states, notably Iceland. Here we see the close interaction between foreign policy practice and uh, the reconstruction of geopolitical identity of a particular state. And in my personal opinion, the China's Arctic policy is, is likely to be incorporated in a comprehensive marine-oriented policy. And we, and we will see how the notion of uh, near Arctic states could contribute to incorporate, for example, trans-Arctic shipping, the trade and business opportunity for China in the Arctic, for example, also the energy supply, the advanced technological cooperation in ice ship, uh, in ice class ship building, and also uh, fishery processing and offshore uh, exploration. All this into China's plan for marine economic development, especially in the context of the newly proposed uh, notion of economic zone of marine time Silk Road by China. So thank you very much. It's end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> and last but not least, Marco Haikele from Arctic Center. And uh, the title of your presentation is so long, so you have to do it yourself. Yes. It's about the media. Yes. Hello. So my name is Marku Heike. I'm coming from the Arctic Center, University of Rovaniemi, uh, Lapland in Rovaniemi, and 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 just a minute here. Uh, in my presentation here, I'm talking about about one of our activities that relates to identity, as the previous presentation, but from a very much different perspective. I'm talking about the people who actually live in the region, in this case, in the barents Euratic region, and how can the regional identity be created by using media networks, by going inside the media. And also the question is, if there is a cross-border regional identity, how can it be sustained in times of uh, political tensions like there are at the moment? Our moderator yesterday gave some media critique about how China is portrayed in media. I'm more worried about what's going on in media between the West and Russia. There are very much black and white stories at the moment on both sides. And the closer to Ukraine we are going, the worse it gets. The narratives and the truths are very much different at the moment. But there's one region where I have not seen that kind of development, and it's in the European North, in the Arctic parts of Europe, where things are still, according to my opinion, going as much as business as normal. And in this presentation, I try to give some uh, possible reasons and ideas why that is the case. But when we are talking about Arctic and media, we quite often use the pictures that we have seen many times during these days here, icebergs, icebreakers, maps with new transport routes. Arctic is seen as, a, some, as an object of something. Something should be done to the Arctic. There are resources, there are indigenous people who might be in danger, climate is changing, new roads are opening. Uh, and this is the picture how the Arctic is portrayed in international media very often. Uh, but the people in the Arctic, they do not follow international media. International media is published in the wrong language, English. It's not the language of the Arctic. The language of the Arctic are local, local languages. And regional media 
operating there is vital for identity building in the region. And very little focus has been has been attentive to what actually is the role of regional media in identity building. Uh, because cross-border communication and media contacts can, it is obvious, help in preventing conflicts and misunderstandings if there are if there is some kind of news feed about what's going on in the wider perspective in the neighboring areas in the Arctic. I'm talking here about the Barents Euro Arctic region. Uh, it's an area of political cooperation and regional cooperation in the European North. And in contrast to the Arctic Council, in the Barents Euro Arctic structure, there is also regional cooperation between the regional units, which are 13 at the moment. And this, of course, creates good possibilities for people to identify themselves to the region. Uh, some parts of the Barents Euro Arctic region are clearly Arctic, some are not Arctic at all, but on the other hand, the new Arctic strategy of Finland states that all of the Europe is an Arctic country. So, we are, it's a bit depending on the definition that you, one wants to use about the Arctic. But the northern identity is truth in any case in this region. But there is also another way to look to the same region. Here is a composition of names of media outlets, media houses operating in the region. They are many in five languages. And this picture gives, or again, a bit kind of different image of what we are talking about. And when we are going inside the media operating there, we are getting an even more different picture of what's going on and what are the needs for regional identity building. And if there is a way to cooperate with the media, there might also be a way to influence or to, to some of the contents, what, how the things are portrayed in the media and what items are interested for journalists. So we are running this project called Barents Media Sphere. It has uh, different aims, increasing the visibility of the region, but the core of the activity is to promote journalist networks and to create possibilities for journalists to meet with each other, discuss and see how things are in other sides of the border. Our project part partners, we are leading the project and our partners are uh, the uh, state TV and radio company from Murmansk and uh, web uh, news portal Barents Observer from Norway. And one should also know that there has been over 20 years a voluntary um, journalist forum, International Barents Press, which is going on without any official support and it's a rare example of professional voluntary cooperation in these parts of the world. And this process is funded by the um, EU Scholastic MP program we are running until the end of this year. Uh, we have been getting people together, arranged training courses and some news materials, but what is actually important can be seen from these pictures. In this picture, we managed to get the editors in chief from the region to meet together for the first time from Russia, Norway, Finland, and Sweden. And on this another picture, we got about 30 young journalists from four countries meet to talk and network with each other. And it was very fascinating to see how easy the cooperation was. There was no national limits. They had the same kind of worldview and same kind of experiences. Some other examples of our activities, training courses for journalists arranged in Norway, Finland, and Russia. Uh, some words about how media landscape is, what kind of media landscape there is in the Barents region. It's, it is different in the Nordic parts and in the Russian side. In the Nordic parts, they are operate in four languages, Finnish, Swedish, Norwegian and Sami. The audiences 
or local or regional, or national or international news are coming from some other sources, agencies, some other arrangements, and the audiences are not cross-border, except to Sami. It's a, and it's a very interesting example, I think unique in the world. The Nordic Sami news in Sami language are broadcasted in national TV networks in Finland, Sweden and Norway. And actually they are very popular also for non-Sami population because they are subtitles in Nordic languages and people can follow what's going on and this kind of service for minority languages is very unique in the world. Mm, in the Russian side, the situation is very much different. My case is here from the Murmansk, where there are several newspapers. Some of them is owned by the regional government, one by the city council. Then there are corporate papers owned by big corporations, some private independent papers, editions of national papers like Komsomolskaya Pravda, and a collection of different kinds of TV channels operating in different principles. And the uh, uh, practicalities and rules of editorial independence are different on the Russian side and on the Nordic side. But in spite of that, we, can, we have seen many things in common. And also, we have seen that the Russian, Russian media is operating, taking things very seriously and the picture that we in the West easily have about the Russian media uh, being some kind, some kind of state propaganda organ, it's not at all the truth. Uh, as a part of the project, we did a survey about Barents media to find out what are the interests, what the media actually wants to know about this cross-border cooperation and Arctic identity in the North. So, this questionnaire was sent to about 1,300 journalists in the north. There really are as many. We got almost 300 responses, and here are some preliminary results of the uh, survey. So we can see that in the northern part of all four countries, the journalists are very interested to make stories about Barents region, especially in Russia, they are very or pretty interested, most of them. And also in Finland, Sweden, Norway, the interest is quite high, actually surprisingly high. Uh, but then, are there enough reports in the media on what's going on in the neighboring countries? Most of the journalists disagree. And again, the amounts of the opinions, they are quite similar in each country. So there is interest, but it, this kind of cross-border media reporting is not actually happen, happening. We also ask, why does it belong to the role of your media to report about the northern region in neighboring countries? And here we have a different picture. Mm, very many journalists feel that it's not the role of the media to report about what's going on. In other regions, especially in Sweden. In Sweden, they clearly are not as much, it's much, much more domestic and regional issues. In other countries, the picture is a bit somehow different. Uh, there are several, some obvious reasons. It's, we are talking about quite small media units in here. They do not have very much resources, personnel. It's difficult to send somebody somewhere for days because nobody's going to do their work during that time. The money is limited, time is limited, everything is limited, but the interest is there. And we have found out, out that there might be ways to well, do something and to support the interest and, and create the contacts. Uh, as a part of the survey, we ask uh, the journalists about their interests to, well, follow cross-border news, do something, and here are some examples of the Russian answers, what they wanted to promote in the media. Uh, we had 
or 100 answers is just a small, some examples about that. But what is interesting is just life and work, social services, business relations, economic development, fishing, some special cases like fishing of company <coughs> perhaps, uh, cooperation, uh, what kind of items are interesting from Russian point of view in the Barents region? Again, economic cooperation was very strongly present. And also the Barents region in the context of world political conflicts. And this is interesting that also regional media who actually does not write about national or international issues are interested about the bigger picture, how Barents or Arctic region is portrayed in the world. Then the Russian journalists want to have again examples of civil society, human rights, and here we can see that there are some different cultures. Somebody says that in Russia these topics are considered, I don't know, scandalous, and therefore they are not interested to write about that. Or then there's something that in the contents which is blocked and considered dangerous for official media. In Russia, there are, well, very many kind of operational models for media, and certainly this official media is one of them. And what the Russian journalists are interested in from the Arctic, ecology, research, projects, possibilities to improve people's lives, different projects, academic research, that might be interesting for you. So there really is an interest to tell about cooperation, science research, everything possible, but not so much possibilities to do that in real life. Uh, in this project, we have been dealing with the parents' neurotic region. We have played with thought to create some kind of pan-Arctic media cooperation. There is obviously some interest for that, but for practical reasons, it's not so easy to realize the personal contacts are very important and they are difficult to arrange in this kind of scale. And one thing is that, because we are not talking of, about any uh, academic project or Arctic Council related project, it's not so easy to find any financing in instruments that could be useful for that kind of cooperation. But I think it's worth to think further about the possibilities to widen the media perspective into the circumpolar Arctic one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now there is time for questions from the floor and from the panel. So please raise your hand, raise your voice. There will be a microphone, ambassador. Good morning. I'd like to thank all the speakers for excellent presentations. Most of them were very thought-provoking. And I'd like, I have simply some couple of comments, very brief comments, and maybe there will be uh, something that would kindle, kindle the further discussion. Uh, there's a comments to some of the uh, reports I heard today and even yesterday. Uh, first comment is that when uh, the uh, potential observers become observers in the Arctic Council, they, s they have to agree to a certain set of criteria which the Arctic Council has agreed. The most important of them is that uh, the observers should uh, respect sovereignty, sovereign rights, and jurisdiction of the Arctic states in the Arctic. And uh, China was one of the observers and has officially proclaimed that it agrees with this principle. Uh, so I think that uh, the discussions, even academic, academic discussion that we're having now on the issue of geo geopolitics, governance, they shouldn't be uh, aimed directly, implicitly or explicitly on watering down this very simple and very basic, uh, very basic thing. Second thing, uh, governance. Uh, I think I spoke in Shanghai uh, on, on the term of governance. It's very hard to play with this word without have a clear and common definition of what you are talking about. 
Different people, different minds understand different things. I'm a Russian. In my mind, we do not distinguish governance, ruling, managing, running. When you talk about governance, in my mind, I have only one word tingling, rule. Who rules the Arctic? In my mind, this is a non-existent problem because those nations who live in the Arctic, they rule the Arctic. And it's a non-existent problem. We had this problem uh, in our relationship with the European Union at the, the first uh, stage of the formation of the Arctic strategy of the European Union. The third strategic uh, uh, target of uh, EU was initially formulated as contribution to further strengthening of multilateral uh, governance of the Arctic. We told our EU partners that we can't agree with them. It's a non-existent problem. We don't need any contribution to something that doesn't exist. After several years of work, we came to general understanding that what was initially meant by the word governance was very simply cooperation. And now it turned into input to international cooperation in the Arctic. That was, that was very well. The problem is no more existed. So you should very, be very clear about that. Next thing, they, of course I cannot agree with the idea that the Arctic coastal states are hegemonizing the Arctic and marginalizing all the rest. I think it's simply, it's effectually wrong. The Arctic uh, coastal states is a very unofficial expert level, level set, of, set of meetings and arrangements which are mainly connected with the issue of continental shelf, full stop. Nothing more, no less. You shouldn't attribute uh, this uh, big, politic, big political, political, political qualities to this, uh, to this thing. So it's, it's, it's there, but the real hegemon of the Arctic, if you wish so, is the Arctic Council. This is the real, the key intergovernmental full-fledged uh, institution that is the only, the single and the only uh, mm, mm, body that uh, arranges the cooperation in the Arctic. And Iceland is the full member of, of the Arctic Council. And it is not, Arctic, Iceland is not marginalized by the uh, uh, a5, A5 coastal states for, for any reason at all. And I don't think that there is, there is uh, any question related to Art Iceland being, uh, being uh, pushed by the inner developed political developments to prove that it's coastal state. There's no need to that. There's no definition. We don't feel there. We, divide, we do not divide ourselves. We do not need the others to divide ourselves into coastal and non-coastal. Non it's simply counterproductive. I think that is also very important for, to understand for observers that observer, status of observer, is not a ticket to the Arctic. The status of observer doesn't give any privileges. It, it gives certain rights of being there inside the Arctic Council, be part of the discussion and, and uh, being part of the, uh, of the projects that, that is there. Nothing more or less. We nationally speaking, less nationally, we don't, we don't divide our Arctic cooperation with non-Arctic state uh, depending on whether this non-Arctic state is an observer or not observer. We are ruled by our own interest. If something is within the common interest of Russia and non-Arctic state, we, we go on cooperating in that. And so this relationship with observers does not, do not, doesn't give us any, any additional obligations with our relations with non-Arctic non states. So things are not so difficult, uh, not, not, so, not so hard to understand as they, uh, as they, as they are. And uh, uh, I think my, my, simply my general uh, comment would be that uh, we should stick from the, uh, we should proceed, while analyzing the situation, the dynamic situation in the Arctic, we should simply proceed from practical realities that exist, exist there and uh, proceed from the uh, agreed rules of the game that exist in the Arctic. The rules of the game in the Arctic is established and will be established by the Arctic states, no doubt about that. But we understand the growing interest in the Arctic of non-Arctic states. We are ready to cooperate with, uh, with non-Arctic states. But there's a very clear set of 
rules of the game, rule of the relationship, which is criteria of observer. And this is something that should be observed. And I think this, if you keep on uh, uh, thinking in free academic research on that, I think that would give us even more productive, productive, productive conclusions. And I don't think there's need for, uh, I'm speaking in, as a, as a pers personal, as, as an expert in this field, I don't think there's a need for China to invent some some new things as near, near Arctic or close to Arctic, because China is a, is a self-standing, very important, huge economic nation with a very clear interest in economic development and stability in the Arctic. And this is quite enough for it to become an active player in the Arctic without, without, without observing something, without creating something that would, uh, that would uh, create in the minds of others some suspicions about real intentions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And then Rasmus. Yes, um, two quick questions. First to Uwe. Um, Uwe, you talked about the fiscal dependency of Greenland on Denmark and the uh, impediments of that fiscal dependency for Greenlandic independence aspirations. Uh, I was wondering of an other dependency, Greenlandic dependency on Denmark, and that's in terms of human capital. And you as a former dean at the University of Greenland, you of course have a lot of experience with Greenlandic human capital. So I was just wondering if you could say something about how Greenlandic human capital dependency on Denmark, how that stops Greenland and what the prospects for that are. And then I have a question for Njord and uh, Deng Beishi. And it's um, the uh, Norwegian-Chinese relationship after the Nobel Prize is of course extremely illustrative because there we go straight to the core matters. We go straight to core interests. And I don't think China has anything particular against Norway. But of course, core interests of the Chinese Communist Party were threatened by the actions of the Nobel Committee. Um, so my question to the two of you is, basically, how does the Arctic relate to core interests of the Chinese Communist Party? Thank you. Maybe we should, uh, these questions uh, are quite substantial, so should we take uh, a round here at the panel, Ufa? Thank you. Um, yes, human resources in Greenland, it's uh, obvious that the size of the population in Greenland, which is a little uh, less than 57,000 people, is a problem to run an independent state. Um, uh, however, I think that um, uh, to return to the, the, the fiscal dependency on Denmark, I think it's a, a huge problem for Greenlandic identity. The idea of being a nation, according to having a language, having a history of its own, uh, etc., uh, and not being able to run a sustainable economy, that's a hard blow to f the feeling of being an independent nation. Uh, so um, uh, I, I think it's uh, not it's uh, not wise to underestimate uh, the actual problem of uh, having uh, or gaining a sustainable economy in Greenland. Once that is obtained, which it may not be, but then uh, of course there's also other uh, questions. Uh, the human resources is uh, normally seen as a uh, mm, technical issue. Yeah, if you don't have uh, enough uh, 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 educated uh, people in Greenland, you invite people to come to work there. This is what has been done, especially Danish people working in Greenland as uh, public servants, etc. Uh, the ambition is also from the University of Greenland, as you mentioned, uh, to educate enough people that will make Greenland uh, uh, able to run its country uh, on its own, as it were. Of course, there's also a lot of other problems like defense. How should a small population defend an area of more than two million square kilometers? Uh, today, uh, I would say that the, the Danish state is not possible, able of doing that as well. So we have to rely on 
NATO cooperation or cooperation with other states. Um, again, I think it's seen as in Greenland <coughs> and by the Greenland government as uh, some kind of technical uh, issue that can be solved uh, one way or other by making agreements with other states. And, and this is not unique. We have small states in the world uh, that do not have a, a, a defense of their own. We're sitting in one of those states for the moment. So, um, uh, but of course, there is a, a big focus on uh, human resources and educated uh, population, not only in public administration, also, of course, in, in the upcoming uh, mining sector, where there's not enough educated or even not enough uh, labor force in Greenland to the project dimension that is now, now being talked about. Thank That's you. Njord, will you respond to this uh, controversial issue? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for a good question regarding the, how, how does the Arctic relate to the core interests of the Chinese Communist Party. So I think the overall uh, picture is that it's a secondary, uh, it's, an, it's a question of secondary importance. Um, I once interviewed uh, a representative from the CAAA, the Chinese Antarctica and Arctic Administration, and she uh, she made it clear that um, when China was not allowed as an observer, or I mean they had to wait for the decision being made in the Arctic Council, she said that's a that's a minor problem for China, but the Nobel Peace Prize was a big problem when it comes to like the relationship to Norway in this two issues. Um, but I also showed you uh, how sort of like the decisions are made and. Um, I think when we try to understand China's engagement in the Arctic, it's not only the economic drivers that are important. It seems to also be a, like a senior leader level that are engaged. I mean, we saw the state visits, uh, etc. So um, I think it has a, has a substantial value also symbolically, but in the, in the overall picture, it's of secondary relevance probably. Yeah, Mr. Tang, would you respond to the same question? Uh, okay, uh, because you are an open question, I also raise uh, two questions uh, for, for more debate, uh, if possible. Uh, the first is whether Arctic is the core interest for China. Apparently, uh, in comparison with the sovereignty integrity, uh, the Arctic interest might be secondary, and is uh, the academia in China uh, is currently making great effort to, to promote the Arctic issue to be of strategic value to China. Uh, and the second is, uh, if China is going to to engage in, in Arctic and to uh, to to have Arctic cooperation, uh, I mean for uh, for the Norway, if Norway is the core player that China can cooperate with, I mean. Uh, if there are alternative partners, for example, in energy uh, cooperation, we have Russia. In Arctic shipping cooperation, we have Iceland. And also in technological cooperation, in shipbuilding, for example, we have Finland. So uh, a Chinese interest in the Arctic, uh, there are some altern alternative choices than Norway. OK, thank you. The gentleman down at the... Yes, please. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, Mark Lantain. I have a general question for the panel. I'm thinking about how some of your comments fit in with the changes that we've seen in China's overall foreign policy. Um, two major changes which have taken place, which are still taking place, is first of all the number of um, actors within China who are putting together foreign policy has increased a lot in a very short time. And the second point is that the number of regions, parts of the world, which are of importance, primary or secondary importance to China, has also grown. So with that in mind, I was wondering if you can comment about how the Arctic and all of the issues about the Arctic that we've been discussing over the past day and a half have affected China's foreign policy thinking on various levels. Thank you. Okay, then could we take a short round on this one before we take the next next question? Anyone want to respond? <laughs> Very briefly, um, uh, it's right that there's 
more regions to take into consideration for, for the formation of uh, Chinese foreign policy. I think, however, we need to keep things in perspective. Uh, China is a big, even rising state, and uh, it has many concerns uh, global, globally. And uh, the Arctic is just one of them. And even if this, uh, this is the talk of this conference, I would say it's fair to, to see uh, from the Chinese perspective that it's, uh, it's way down, not way down, but it's, it, it's not on the top of the agenda. It's uh, maybe some, some way down. Uh, so there are many other uh, uh, urgent uh, uh, areas to, to keep in mind for uh, Chinese foreign policy making. Uh, I think um, um, I think that there's um, the, there's, uh, there's a strongness of argument in the uh, in, uh, concerning Arctic matters in the Chinese policy formulation uh, about the argument that it uh, it uh, Arctic should be a global issue, not only a regional one, and this is uh, just make it uh, a little bit different from uh, from pure interest. Uh, policy, so so there might be that this uh, difference in in the, the substance of the character of the policy area of, of the Arctic. Thank you. you I can give a brief comment. So I, I agree with most of uh, what uh, Uffe said. Uh, just one. So one dimension I think is uh, relevant here is the very long perspectives, like time perspective, China has <clears throat> to investments and uh, etc. So uh, in uh, in more. Um, our Western way of thinking about, you know, investments, etc., is much shorter time horizons. So, I think for the Chinese government, um, the engagement in the Arctic is a much more like long term, really long term. Marco, mm, yes, just one practical example. So next week there will be a high-level visit from China to Finland, also to Rovaniemi, and after that visit from the top five persons in the Chinese political system. Three of them have been in Rovaniemi at the Arctic Circle, Circle, and no other major country in the world has sent that kind of people to the north. So there must be some reasons for that. Of course, one reason is that each of them has seen the Santa Claus. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Dung? Okay, I, I think there might be three reasons why China hasn't published its active policy, because uh, the the Chinese diplomacy, I mean, for, for any uh, publica uh, publication of Ch uh, China's diplomatic policy, the role is prudence. Uh -huh. And the second is because of the limited knowledge and the lack of assessment and e evaluation of the Arctic, and also the ministerial coordination uh, for the Arctic uh, 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 I mean, in the the court, uh, the, ministry, um, the ministerial coordination, which means active issue will co coordinate many minister, uh, 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 will incorporate many uh, ministries in China. I mean, the coordination is also very complex. But also, also we can see uh, the the practice of foreign. Uh, uh, I mean, the practice of foreign uh, uh, policy and diplomacy uh, has already been undertaken, which also precedes the uh, the publishment of the foreign policy. So, the ongoing cooperation and practice, yeah, uh, I mean, has been done. Okay, thank you. We have five more minutes before coffee, and please. Anders Oskal from the International Center for Reindeer Husbandry. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists and the commenters for very rewarding perspectives, very interesting indeed, equally so yesterday. Uh, I, have, I don't have a question, but rather a comment to uh, Marco, um, as I found your project very interesting. But I would like to highlight especially one aspect that I think is, is, um, is of, of key importance. You mentioned um, that uh, regional or local languages are very important for, for regional media and also for identity formation. And I totally agree, uh, but I would like to add that it's even more than that, of course. It is very important for language preservation, for cultural preservation. And as far as indigenous, pe indigenous peoples goes, 
the traditional knowledge which was mentioned by the, the Chinese uh, counselor also yesterday, upon which our societies are, uh, traditional societies are founded. Uh, to, uh, the, the indigenous languages are the carrier of that knowledge, so from that perspective also very important. And I might add that this is also um, uh, emphasized by the Arctic Council, for instance through initiatives such as uh, the Arctic Indigenous Languages Symposium, uh, initiatives under the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment, etc. So I would like to commemorate uh, this aspect of your project. Very, uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do the panel have uh, something to add, something before we have our coffee break? Yes, please. Uh, in addition to what Anna has just said, uh, I think it's also important to notice that there are big differences in the Arctic about uh, indigenous languages. Some uh, areas are better off than others. And uh, here we can mention the Inuit situation. Uh, actually, uh, in Greenland, there is uh, uh, Inuit language uh, papers. There's uh, two published uh, papers, weeklies, uh, uh, published both in, uh, in Danish and in Greenlandic, or uh, the Inuit Greenlandic version. Uh, and there's also a, website, a common website for the two uh, private uh, newspapers, and then there's a website from the, the public-owned uh, news media, also in Greenlandic. And, and uh, there's a big uh, importance for the Greenlandic to be able to discuss politically and publicly in their own language. So the situation is uh, dif different in different areas of the Arctic. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Marco, do you want to yes. comment? I might add one thing to the concept of Arctic identity theme for the regional perspective. One problem is that all the Arctic affairs are done in the capitals, and there is not any regional level in Arctic cooperation, and I cannot see very many possibilities to create that one, but seeing from the point of the people living there, it's one reason why the Arctic cooperation in such looks quite distant, with the exception of indigenous people who are very well represented. But that's the kind of issue that has been discussed in Finland. Okay. We have, um, we have a final comment or question from Dr. Yang. Uh, a very short comment to response to the uh, uh, Russian ambassador. Uh, he just mentioned a very important issue about the uh, when we discuss something, just so we use some term terminology, the terms, just as governance. But uh, if we can now understand the same meaning of that term, maybe a confusing, even understand, could not be uh, misunderstood each other. So uh, governance is that. I think so for China, we learn this, this, new, this word, also new for China. I think so for the Arctic governance, I the quoted from the, uh, the, the Arctic, uh, Arctic Governance Project. Uh, governance is a social function centered on the effort to steer a human action toward collective outcomes that are benefit to society and away from harmful outcomes. Governance system emerged to address the variety of the uh, society, societal need, ranging from the production of public good, such as maintain healthy public, uh, population of living resources and uh, subject to the human uh, harvesting to avoid uh, the public bad. Uh, that is to, to, to the, uh, moment, please, uh, to uh, uh, the curbing the spread of the contem uh, uh, contaminants across the border, avoid environment impact. I think, sir, in, that, in this sense, the uh, Gorbachev's uh, speech in Murmansk in, in 1990s, that's to inaugurate the governance in this region. But the, I think so, that's very important, uh, Ambassador, that when we, maybe it's uh, possible for the social scientists to work together to make some de uh, definition of some important uh, words together that let us understand each other. Uh, another example is that of security the concept of security. 
uh, Gear, you are the uh, expert on Asia. I uh, you know in Japan, China, and Korea, we use the uh, concept of security. We call it Anquan, a uh, two-character. Uh, the, the meaning for China is that I means stable, stability, and peace. Chuan means all together and comprehensive. But in the concept of the United States, security is mean the dominant uh, uh, security the, over the other. That's a quite different concept of security. Uh, also, uh, we have a different uh, meaning we can discuss as some new, put, some new input to that concept. But also, we can reach a consensus about the definition of the word or terms. That's my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Ambassador and to Dr. Yang for bringing this up. And I think it's a very good uh, issue to continue to debate uh, over coffee and uh, in the coming years. Uh, thank you very much, everybody.